Lincoln, tap into Barnegat, and employer of each Barnegat Township School District. The Barnegat Township Municipal Building, and it's been filed with the Barnegat Township Municipal Clerk in conjunction with Open Public Meetings Act. Uh, roll call. Mr. Geddes? Here. Mr. O'Brien? Here. Mrs. Pereira? Here. Mr. Quelch? Here. Ms. Sarno? Mr. Zawicki? Here. Mr. Sherman? Here. And Mr. Hickey? My salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'm looking for a motion to uh, approve the addition to the agenda. We so have these moved. last three years. So moved. Do Second. Do you want to read them all? Uh, the three additions uh, were all to personnel. Uh, 26, as reflected on your agenda, is a motion to approve the following summer school facilitators at the BEI hourly rate. We had three additional staff members, uh, or we had three staff members that are working the program, but we need an additional uh, couple weeks to kind of uh, give the students that are enrolled in that program an opportunity to complete it. Uh, 27, approve uh, uh, Mr. Joseph Raguso as our security coordinator to update our emergency management plan. And uh, the last one, 28, is a motion to approve the following retirement. Um, so congratulations. Thank you. All right, so we had a motion. Ms. Confidence? Yes. Mr. Quelch? Yes. Mr. Sarno? Yes. Mr. Zawicki? Yes. Mr. O'Brien? Yes. Mrs. Pereira? Yes. Mr. Quelch? Yes. Sarno? Yes. <laughs> yes. Right. Item number six, uh, one through three, is the uh, approval of minutes from the regular session from 22 June 2020, which was the board retreat and then the regular and executive sessions from June 23rd, 2020. Second. Ms. Continanza. Yes. Mr. Geddes? Yes. Mr. O'Brien? Yes. Mrs. Pereira? Yes. Mr. Quelch? Yes. Mr. Zawicki? Yes. Mr. Sherman? Yes. And Mr. Hickey? Yes. All right, motion carried. Item number seven is our Barnegat Education Association liaison, Mrs. Mayo, with an update. Hi, can you hear me? All right, great, thank you. So good evening. The association would like to thank the Board of Education and Dr. Latwis for our new contract. This contract is the first one in 14 years where 12-month employees received their pay increase on July 15th. We would also like to thank the Board of Education and Dr. Latwis for diligently and effectively working on a plan to reopen the school. We genuinely appreciate the full range of stakeholders that participated in this process. Another example of how the Barnegat District works collaboratively with the community, staff, and admin. As we embark on these unusual circumstances, we are confident that our superintendent and board of education will continue to make the best decisions possible for our district. Thanks, that's it. Thank you, Mrs. Mayo. Thank you. Can you turn up the video in the room from uh, the video volume in the room, just a, just a smidge for everybody? Thank you. Up next is item number eight, superintendents, district highlights, information and comments. Thank you very much. Uh, before I turn this over to our director of curriculum and instruction, uh, Mr. Barbieri, to present the uh, reopening plan uh, that's up for vote tonight. I just wanted to take an opportunity to piggyback on what Ms. Mayo said and uh, thank uh, all the different stakeholders that took part in the reopening task force. Uh, we had BEA leadership there. We had teachers, uh, nurses, parents, administration, and uh, board representation. And, uh, you know, we had a good group of about 50 or so people. And I felt that, you know, we were given a task in a very short period of time to turn this around. And uh, I really respect and appreciate everybody coming together and really clearing their schedules in a short period of time to, uh, to fully participate. 
um, and being able to put together this plan and uh, within the guidance that we received from the state. So um, without further ado, I'll pass this over to Mr. Barbieri uh, to uh, run through a uh, presentation on our plan. Thank you, Dr. Yes, please. Let me uh, see if that is set up. That's a great idea. Check one, two. Is this getting audio? Can you guys hear me? No. Can't hear through the speakers. But yeah. Can you hear through the speakers? Um, how about I turn this off and speak loudly, and then I'm going to so the folks on the internet can hear me? What's that? I don't want my computer mic at all. Because it'll go through that microphone to the yeah. system. Oh, even better. Okay, fantastic. Hi, good evening, everyone. <laughs> Um, thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you to Dr. Lawis and the Board of Education. Thank you to the members of the public. And uh, I, I'm really excited to be here with you tonight sharing uh, the reopening plan. So I see that my screen is up there, but I don't see the, it's a picture of me and I'd rather much have the <laughs> picture of the presentation. So give me one second to figure out how we can look at this. Hmm. You have to make him a presenter, I think. I think he can share. Is it saying no? All right, go ahead. All right, Kelly, we need your magic. <laughs> I have this here. And oh, we need Zoom first. Thank you for your patience, ladies. I know a plethora of dad jokes, so if we really <laughs> run into a snag, I can regale you with some of those. My kids actually made the tragic error of getting me a book of dad jokes for Father's Day. Yes, <laughs> man. <laughs> I guess he could share that. Yeah, he could share the file with me. Max security Oh, okay. We could share all participants, one participant at a time. We can start sharing when someone else is sharing on the host. I mean, is this real life? <laughs> I'm dying up here, man. I'm dying. That's the one you got. I, I warned you. Okay. Um, you didn't say it. Why, why is the word dark spelled with the letter K and not letter C? Because you can't see in the dark. Uh, Let's see what you did there. Uh, oh, man. man. <laughs> All of a sudden, the reopening plan looks great. It's better than the jokes. Get that thing fixed. <laughs> I guess comedian isn't on your no, resume. No, I never even thought. <laughs> what if he shares it with Mike? Hey, the district doesn't pay extra for entertainment, you know. <laughs> you want to email it to Mike, and then maybe Mike can share. I did. I did share with uh, Mike already. Um, the challenge will be advancing slides, but you can do that. So this, uh, I mean, I think that would be less painful. That would be less painful than what's going on here. <laughs> you think that's right? Oh. Uh, 
No, this is good. Good start. Okay, superb. Let's try this. Okay. Present that, Jim. Present this. Present that. Oh, fantastic. Round of applause for Kelly West. All right. We are. Okay. Uh, in all seriousness, folks, let me let me start over. Take two. Um, seriously, thank you so much, Dr. Lawless, member of the members of the Board of Education, uh, and members of the public being here tonight. And I'd also like to thank I see Mr. Junker in the audience as well for his participation, uh, because uh, the BEA has played a, a big role in this. So, a little bit about uh, what it is we're trying to accomplish. Uh, you know, the goals for the reopening plan are uh, pretty simple. In my mind, there's three you know, main goals we're trying to accomplish here. One is the safety, maximizing the safety of students and staff. Okay, one is, of course, maximizing student outcomes in the areas of academic, social, emotional domains. And, of course, providing uh, sustainable programs. And we felt very strongly about offering the choice, okay, of in-person, which is like a hybrid, which I'll get into momentarily, and virtual learning. The process for creating the reopening plan, uh, Dr. Let oh boy, Dr. Letwis addressed that a little bit uh, earlier. We started with a community survey and approximately 2,000 responses, and we recognized that not all folks have availability of internet. So, working with Mr. Brennan's office, we were trying to coordinate and look at a whole list of families in the district who potentially had not responded, so we can reach out to them directly and garner their input. It's very important uh, for us to make sure that everyone in the community, 100%. Uh, of the community has access to reliable internet and to devices. And that's a, a common phrase you'll be hearing in the coming days called the digital divide. You know, the folks who do and don't have access to these different things. Um, and then we took that uh, feedback and sat down with, as Dr. Lett was said, approximately 50 individuals, the district uh, reopening task force, members of the board of education, parents, community stakeholders, administrators, teachers, education service providers, food service vendors, and other key staff members to get a multiplicity of perspectives. Uh, you know, there's the old expression that all of us is smarter than any one of us, but we really had to put all of our heads together and look at this complex problem from many different, uh, you know, from many different uh, angles. Um, and of course, we are, uh, we are bound, if you will, by the parameters uh, from the state of New Jersey. Uh, I'll be speaking to that throughout the presentation. That's known as the, the NJDOE, the Road Back Plan. It's a 107 page document. Um, which, oh, Joyce. which we did, of course, analyze. And in that Road Back Plan, there are two elements I'll be sharing with you. One is what's called uh, anticipated minimum standards. That's, of course, the floor uh, that, you, that everyone must do. Okay, of course, you can go beyond that. And then they provide considerations which are not required, but things that you are encouraged to do. And I'll, be, I'll share those with you momentarily. We then created pandemic response teams at each of the schools. And uh, as uh, Dr. Lau was indicated with um, our uh, head of security, we took a hard look at our emergency operations and are updating that to be relevant to the, the, you know, the needs of the time. And you know, we really tried our best to uh, craft a plan that met the needs of our community. And of course, we have now submitted that draft to the Board of Education tonight for their review. So this is the road back. Uh, there's a link here. You can peruse it at your leisure. These are the 10 critical areas of operation. Each of these is addressed in our district's plan, and I'll be using these as the talking points for the presentation tonight. So I'll be going through each one of these and speaking to how we will be meeting those requirements, okay? Um, and they're up there. I'll just pause a moment for you to read them. But of course, they're going to be featured uh, in the presentation. And then next are the, uh, not the required, but the encouraged areas, the recommended uh, areas. And it is recommended that uh, districts address all of these in the reopening plan. We have, um, some of them are still fluid. I will mention this is a uh, living document. Uh, I'm thinking in particular uh, with childcare issues. I know that even at, as of press time now, we are still working out some of the details with that. So there are some points that you know, and, and we do recognize as guidance continues to change between now and September 1st, there are elements of this plan that may need to be flexible and change with that. Um, but of course, we have to comply with, you know, regulations from the state and federal government. So with that in mind, the, the first and most important thing on, on everyone's mind is well, what is school going to look like? 
and we did feel strongly about uh, offering two options. And of course, um, uh, these are these are things that, uh, again, from the state of New Jersey are required, but we feel that it's also the right thing to do. Uh, we know that people are coming from very different backgrounds and situations. Um, you, you know, they may have a, a student or a family member who is medically fragile, might, it might be immunocompromised or things like that. Uh, and so there are some families and uh, that are just not ready to send their child back to school. And so we have a very solemn uh, duty to provide a free and appropriate public education to those folks. So we had to have a, a mix of both um, in-person hybrid, and I'll speak to that momentarily, and the full virtual. So starting with the hybrid, what that would look like is uh, for the majority of the students, and there are some exceptions we'll get to a little, a little later, you'll see, but the majority of students are divided, divided into two cohorts. So uh, Jimmy, the fourth grader, might be in cohort one and Sally might be in cohort two. And Jimmy's gonna go to school on Monday, Wednesday. Sally's gonna go Tuesday, Thursday, and everyone's gonna be full virtual Friday. And the advantages of that are now we've cut the capacity of the buildings in half, which allows us to maintain social distancing in the classrooms. We'll speak to more about why that's important uh, momentarily, but that's the whole point about dividing the, the cohorts in half is that we can maintain social distancing with about 50% capacity in the buildings. Uh, so uh, two cohorts, Monday, Wednesday, Tuesday, Thursday, for the in-person. And on the days in which the children are not in person, it's an acronym that we've invented called a, a READ day, Remote Extension Activity Day, when the children are not in person. This is your time for independent practice. It's your time for review. And importantly, the activities on these days are differentiated. So uh, as teachers use formative assessment to determine which students have mastered a particular concept and which students have not, they can then on those read days differentiate because if Jimmy needs extra practice or review and didn't quite master it, I might get one activity. But if you know Dave did master that concept, he doesn't need, we don't need to waste his time just practicing the same thing over and over. He can get an extension or enrichment or find some way to continue his learning in a meaningful way. It is important to note that uh, some of the feedback, one of the most important pieces of feedback that we received from families in the community during uh, the springtime was that uh, <laughs> it's too much really to expect for parents to be the teacher. You know, it's really too much to ask parents to be sitting at the kitchen table trying to help their kid, you know, understand how to multiply fa fractions for the first time or, or how to do a character tree for the first time, right? So we're going to prioritize the introduction of new materials and uh, skills and content on those in-person days. That's the, the best place for learning is the classroom. I think we can all agree that, that you know, putting the health and safety concerns aside, the classroom is the best place for learning. And there are quality interactions in the classroom that just can't be duplicated you know, over, a, over an internet connection. So those in-person days are prioritized for the introduction of new material and new content and new skills. So on a Monday, for example, the teacher will be modeling for the children how to multiply fractions or whatever the skill might be. And then after we determine, okay, hey, you guys got it, you guys didn't, and stuff like that, the teacher can then assign, and the beauty of Google Classroom is you can send individual assignments to students anonymously. So I don't know what you got or he got or she got or whatnot. Everyone's just getting their own thing. Um, and I really wanna thank the board because we've made a huge uh, investment in this district in using data to drive instruction through programs like Linkit and ESGI and stuff like that. So this is a capacity that we have now that we did not have even just a couple of years ago. So again, uh, Monday, Wednesday, Tuesday, Thursday for in-person, the days when they're not present will be those read days. Uh, and we are planning the best, uh, to the best extent possible uh, to keep siblings together. That was a request that we had from families that, you know, it's just unmanageable if I'm running to the bus stop every single day or if an older sibling needs to watch a younger sibling. Um, though we are also honoring requests. Uh, there have been a handful of parents who forever, you know, for whatever reason, do want their children, okay, you know, to, to go on opposite days or whatnot because we are trying to be as um, conducive to the needs of individual families as possible. Um, okay, so in, in this model, in the hybrid model, Fridays are virtual for all students except at-risk students. A big part of the roadback plan is making sure that we provide additional supports uh, for, for the children who need them. Of course, that's something that we naturally want to do anyway as educators. Uh, but when I say at-risk, I mean maybe uh, students who are in the English as a second language program and would really benefit from extra contact time. Students who are on the response to intervention continuum and receiving basic skills instruction and would benefit from another day present at school. These are some of the at-risk groups that uh, if we have the opportunity to bring them in, 
uh, uh, you know, it's incumbent upon us to do so. Um, and there are also some special education programs that would run daily. Some of our special education uh, cl classes are small enough where they can do social, you know, socially distant learning um, because the class is, you know, small enough uh, number uh, anyway. So again, if we can bring those kids in every day and, uh, you know, they would benefit from it, then it makes sense to do so. Elementary cohorts are designed to keep students with their friends. Uh, one of the biggest you know, concerns that we heard coming out of the reconfiguration was the social emotional needs of the kids and the desire for, for parents and for students to be with uh, kids that they know and specifically to be with their friends. So I wanna give uh, uh, credit to Regina Santola, our elementary uh, supervisor and her team for the work that she's done. Uh, Michelle Johns, our new elementary VP and, uh, and others that did an amazing job hand scheduling these thousands of children based on feedback from their teachers on, okay, well, Jimmy's friends with Joey or Tommy's friends with Billy or whatnot. And to the extent that they were, you know, perhaps reaching out to parents, hey, you know what, if, if you could be with one kid in the class, who would you want it to be with and so on and so forth? Because listen, we're all, we're all humans. There's nothing better than having that, that close trusted friend, um, that, that one kid that you, or, or two kids that you really know and get along really well with, to be having that experience together. So, you know, if, if there is any trepidation, well, there's nothing better than going through that experience with your best friend by your side. So we, we not only looked at who are they friends with, but then all the things that go into balancing and creating classes, making sure there's a good mix of ability levels, a good mix of, you know, maybe personalities of, uh, you know, students with different needs, things of that nature. And all of those were taken into consideration when, when creating these classes. Another uh, element that we're really excited about, I want to give credit to uh, Mr. Steve Nickel and Mr. Steve Brennan for their work in uh, accelerating what's been a district goal with the, um, you know, looking at the strategic plan is moving towards one-to-one -one on demand access. But we've been able to, you know, through their uh, leadership, uh, Mr. Brennan and Mr. Nickel have been able to uh, accelerate that timeline. And we're uh, planning to be able to go one-to-one. -one, so one student per device, okay, uh, for students in grades seven to 12. And that would be a device that, the, that would be just, you know, issued to that one particular student. So they wouldn't need to share or worry about any of those types of concerns. Um, and we felt that it was better to prioritize this at the secondary level for a number of reasons, but obviously those children are more independent. They're doing more complex work that requires a computer. And for the young ones, we do have so many concerns with screen time with the, with the younger ones. Um, so yes, there will absolutely be, you know, technology and support for the little ones. Um, in addition, obviously we will be sending home devices to any family that requests it. But in terms of the learning environment, uh, for the 712 students, that will be one-to-one. -one. And of course, all students will be enrolled in a Google Classroom or Class Jojo from day one, so that if, uh, for whatever reason, we do need to, uh, you know, if we are mandated or for whatever reason, we have to go full virtual for everyone. If the district has to shut down for in-person due to uh, health and safety concerns, we can seamlessly move uh, from a hybrid environment to a fully virtual environment. I'm sure there's 101 questions. <laughs> Some of them may get answered during the presentation. Um, and then of course, there'll be time for, qu for questions at the end. Uh, but if I may, just moving to the idea of the full virtual, what does that look like? So students, as we mentioned, have already been assigned to classes. We, um, we anticipate from the parent survey that approximately 15% of our students will select the full virtual option. Uh, you know, again, that may change between now and September and some kids who said they wanted it may elect to go one way or, or, or the other conversely. Um, so uh, we are getting ready to send out the, you know, sort of final official, uh, you know, uh, letter of intent to parents to, to identify which kids definitely want to take uh, advantage of the full virtual um, option. But those children are already scheduled and embedded in classes. And so to keep them connected, um, they will be participating, you know, remotely, but they will be participating with their peers as if they were, um, you know, in that in that class already because they are scheduled in that class. Um, and so, again, this helps to, for it to go seamlessly. If, you know, we start school and, and, and Jimmy, the fourth grader, you know, my mom decides to keep me home. And then as September rolls around, she feels more comfortable and decides to send me in. Well, I already know the kids in that class. It's already paved the way for me to have a, have a, a smoother return to school. This is one of the most important points, so I do want to take a minute to highlight this. Uh, the, the Department of Ed has emphasized very you know, strongly that curriculum instruction and assessments are the same to the greatest extent possible um, as, as students uh, undergoing uh, you know, the, the in-person hybrid. 
Um, and this is a quote directly from the NJDOE guidance on this uh, matter. Zaglus, for example, I, the bolding is my emphasis, but I think it's it's so relevant to what we're trying to say here. Uh, the same standards based, excuse me, standards based instruction of the same quality and rigor as that afforded to all other students in the district, uh, including the full time remote learning must adhere to the length of school day requirements, local attendance policies, and other local policies governing delivery of service to and district expectations of students participating in remote programs. So what that all means, and, and I really want to take a minute to emphasize this because I don't want there to be any confusion or misconception about what this full virtual option in September will look like because it's going to look very different, okay, from the experience that the children had in the spring. In the spring, you know, we were, we were being re reactive to a once in a century pandemic. We've now had the chance to plan and prepare and we're going into September much more proactive. And I'll talk more about those specific measures that have been taken later in the presentation. However, you know, we do know that uh, some children and families uh, had varying experiences. And for some kids, there was maybe the perception of, oh, well, I only have, you know, 90 minutes worth of work. I can do my work in the morning and then kind of go play in the afternoon. Well, that's not the case. If it's a six-hour school day, we need to be very clear that the full virtual, the children on the fully virtual are expected to complete approximately six hours of schoolwork each day. That does not mean six hours sitting in front of a screen. It means six hours of meaningful, engaging schoolwork, projects, reading, uh, you know, whatever activities the teacher has designed, okay? But it is not the, quote, easy way out. It is not, quote, easier than the in-person. And we really need to get that message out because I'm very concerned, quite frankly, that we, we don't want some kids to, or, or you know, families to pick that option because they feel that it might somehow be easier or less work or they're gonna get better grades or, or anything like that. It is to the greatest extent possible, the same curriculum, instruction and assessment in the classroom and outside the classroom. Um, so that's something I think we really need to be you know, quite clear about from the beginning. That being said, the work obviously will be completed virtually. Um, we'll talk more about that later for what those expectations are. And then on Fridays, which is full virtual for everyone, the kids, both the in-person kids and the virtual kids, will then have the chance to interact you know, more through their uh, Google Meets and, and things of that nature so that the full virtual kids do feel connected and do feel part of the you know, classroom experience. Okay, so the first topic of those conditions for learning is health and safety. Obviously, that's what's paramount in everyone's mind. So I'm just going to take a minute and talk a little bit about what that looks like. Obviously, we're beholden to all of the CDC, state, and local guidelines. Um, I'm just going to highlight some of these points because I'm, you know, just looking at the, the, the clock here and wanted to make sure we, uh, you know, have enough time to touch on all these things. Uh, obviously, uh, the idea of screening, temperature checks, social distancing in the classroom, you know, those things are, are first and foremost on people's minds. The cleaning and disinfecting uh, procedures, we're going to talk a lot more about that later in the uh, presentation. Um, the uh, buildings and grounds and the uh, maintenance and custodial staff has done an excellent job in preparing very specialized plans for each area of the district that might need cleaning and sanitizing. So, uh, you know, there are procedures, we'll, we'll be speaking about that throughout the presentation for screening of, of if there's a student suspected of having symptoms, um, staff members were asking to self-report um, if they're feeling symptoms. Um, and then the district will be, as we always do with children's health and wellness, monitoring the children um, for signs and symptoms as well. Face coverings, I know this, is, this has been a, a pretty contentious issue in the news. Uh, according to State of New Jersey, staff and visitors must wear face coverings. And it says in there that students are strongly encouraged to when social distancing cannot be maintained. Now, to be clear, uh, students may remove face coverings once they're seated at their desk in a socially distant manner. I know that there are some districts that are opting to not go half capacity. Um, under this plan, then those children would be forced to wear a mask the entire day. We feel that that is an onerous burden, particularly for some of the young ones, um, to try to wear this you know, for, for six hours without a break is, is pretty tough. Uh, so the advantage of the half capacity uh, hybrid plan is that we can space out the desks in a classroom in a socially distant manner. So the kids as they're sitting there working independently are able to take their masks off. And then of course, put them on if they walk around the classroom or you know, are, are, are traversing the building or what, what, you know, whatever the case may be. 
Um, but we also didn't want to get into a um, situation with kids where they're going to be, quote, punished for taking off their mask or things like that. So it's not going to go into the student code of conduct as a disciplinary thing, but we're going to try to use uh, any students who are non-compliant with the mask as more of a teachable moment. Okay, so what are some of the other precautions that we're taking about? Uh, minimizing the use of shared objects, uh, working with uh, Mr. Brennan and facility staff to ensure that all indoor facilities have adequate ventilation, hand sanitizing stations, uh, ensuring the students are uh, washing their hands frequently. And uh, I would like to just take a minute and dwell on the last point. Uh, the uh, Arts Ed New Jersey organization has published a study. Uh, it was a joint study from University of Colorado and U University of Maryland on uh, the way in which aerosols, you know, the, the droplets that may potentially uh, spread uh, SARS-CoV-2, how are the aerosols um, dispersed by various musical instruments? Because when you think about it, playing a flute or playing a trumpet or, or singing, you know, there's, there's, you know, some concerns and rightly so for how, um, you know, that may be spreading. So uh, those universities conducted uh, comprehensive tests and have provided guidance on okay, if you have a trombone, this is what you should do. If you have a flute, this is what you should do. If you have, you know, based on each different type of instrument and how um, best to arrange uh, music and band classrooms and how to respond to that. And I do just want to take a minute and uh, highlight that because of course we're all very, very proud of our uh, music education program. We were rated actually one of the best in the nation uh, for music education. Um, so we have the uh, NEMC uh, uh, Best Communities for Music Education Award um, posted up there. So that is something that we take very, very seriously. Okay, transportation. So, uh, of course, we're examining the bus routes. Uh, uh, Mrs. Lisa Vargas, our transportation coordinator, has done an excellent job with that. Um, again, we're, we're looking to uh, do it in the most efficient uh, way possible while still, uh, you know, of, of course, protecting the health and safety uh, of, the, of the driver and the students. You see there some of the um, precautions that are being taken. And of course, parents have the uh, option to opt out. And that was one of the questions in the survey, home to parents. And there was a, uh, a decent percentage, about 30, I think 38% of parents um, uh, declined transportation and would feel more comfortable using a uh, private transportation method. So here are some of the health and safety precautions. Drivers will use a proper disinfectant solution um, after each route to uh, clean and sanitize key touch points. And then daily, each bus will undergo a complete disinfectant, uh, disinfection uh, process. And in the interest of time, I mean, I will, um, I will put this presentation on the uh, website. You can peruse it at your leisure, but just for the interest of time, if you don't mind, I wanna make sure I get through all of these things. Okay, so student flow, moving around the buildings. Um, so our principals are very skillful in you know, knowing their buildings, knowing the layout, knowing the flow, knowing these different areas and, and things like that, uh, so that they can uh, rework the logistics, if you will, of their buildings to be more conducive to these uh, situations. So what does that look like? Uh, One-way hallways, you know, single unidirectional hallways, so that kids aren't coming face-to-face -face with each other. Um, new signage, you know, we've all seen that signage that, you know, if, if you could jump into a time machine two years ago and see one of those floor stickers, it wouldn't like even mean anything. And now they're so ubiquitous that they're, you know, it's, it's uh, very interesting how, how much uh, the world has changed, but we're changing with it. You'll notice sneeze guards in the main office. Um, and uh, they're, as I mentioned, the principals are very skillful. I'll give you one example of that. So elementary specials are 43 minutes per day generally. They're being reduced to 30 minutes per day to allow some additional time so that you don't have one class coming in as one class is going out so one class can safely leave. The teacher has time to sanitize any um, you know, materials or whatever the case may be to maybe clean up and organize or let's say I'm in an art room and this is one box of uh, you know, materials for my period one class. I can put all those away and get a separate box of materials for period two class. So we don't have cross-contamination things of that uh, nature. And because uh, for the elementary teachers, 
that 43 minute special is uh, coincides with their prep each day to be in compliance uh, with the BEA agreement. We have redone the schedule of the day from a, from a seven hour day to a six hour day. Um, I'll explain more about that at the end. But that, that 13 minutes of prep time was given back to the teachers at the conclusion of the day to be in alignment with the, with the needs of the contract. Okay, screening PPE in response to students and staff. Um, a lot of this comes directly, uh, you know, guidance from the, the Department of Ed. Uh, there's not a, a lot that we have uh, latitude with in terms of, obviously, we're going to be screening students. Obviously, we're going to be doing it respectfully, you know, trying to uh, honor their privacy, trying to uh, honor their dignity. No one obviously wants to be singled out or things like that. Um, so we do have a, a procedure we're calling the green folder procedure, um, and that is a nod to procedures that we ha already have in place at the high school, the um, uh, so-called orange folder procedure, so that if a student is um, uh, suspected, let's say, under the influence of drugs or alcohol, we can use code words and things of that nature to identify, uh, you know, the student and, and alert the administration without obviously calling undue attention to the to the child. So you can see there, uh, the, uh, the procedures are listed out. Um, and then without getting too far afield, you know, some people may have questions about, well, does this mean we're going to have to close the school or, or things of that nature? Um, you know, those details were obviously still uh, evolving um, and in consultation with Dr. Lawless and the Board of Education. You know, we will need to, so this is the reopening plan. We'll need then to have potentially a reclosure plan that, you know, if the schools get open, it, what would that look like if there is an outbreak? But there are some procedures we would already have in place. If there's a single case, closing a closing a closing um, closing the classroom for 72 hours, a lot of time for disinfecting. Uh, the, the other children can be, um, you know, switched to full virtual, things of that nature. Um, and, of course, anything that we're going to be doing is going to be done in accordance with um, uh, HIPAA privacy laws. Okay, response to students or staff presenting symptoms. Uh, we have identified areas in, the, in each building where if a child is potentially uh, showing symptoms of COVID-19, they can be safely and respectfully isolated from others. Uh, uh, we are bound uh, by uh, the need to alert the um, Ocean County Health Department. So you see the district officials must immediately notify local health officials of confirmed case while again maintaining uh, confidentiality. But the key takeaway kind of from this is we're already planning that if a, if a classroom did have to close or let's say, you know, a teacher were um, uh, COVID positive, um, you know, what, what would we do? Well, things like buddy classrooms, you know, the ability to go full remote if need be. There are actually tremendous advantages to the reconfiguration model uh, actually at this time, because now having say all third grade in one building or all second grade in one building, you, it's much easier to have buddy classrooms where uh, we can be you know, following the same curriculum on the same pace and things like that. So uh, yes, we have a, uh, a substitute uh, teacher service company through Insight, uh, but it's very difficult for that substitute to just kind of drop into the middle and know what's going on. Well, now they have a buddy that's literally on the same page and doing the same thing with them and, and can give them the support and the guidance. Uh, we also have um, four master teachers, uh, four RTI data coaches, and these are all instructional support staff that can, you know, provide additional guidance and support if a classroom does need to go uh, remote, uh, you know, on the drop of a hat. Contact tracing. This is a required element of the plan. Uh, really, honestly, not much to say here other than we are uh, bound to report to Ocean County Health Department uh, anyone who is sent home as suspected. Of, of being COVID-19, and then they are responsible for all contact tracing operations. The district does not handle that. Facilities cleaning procedure. This part is incredibly detailed. Um, suffice to say that uh, uh, under the leadership of Mr. Brennan, as I said, the, the uh, buildings and grounds and custodial maintenance staff develop specialized plans for each of the following areas. So um, without you know, going into too much depth, you can peruse the plan yourself and, and read what that looks like. But I did just want to highlight, I thought it was very you know, wise on their part to have specialized cleaning procedures based on the needs of different areas. 
food service, meals. Okay, so obviously the big thing here is that we are going to discontinue family style self-service and buffet style dining. Uh, we've been working very closely with Chartwells, our food service provider. They're an international organization, so they have actually a tremendous amount of experience uh, dealing with this very same issue in other countries that have, you know, with schools that have already opened, uh, you know, in other countries. So we're working with them to identify what that uh, would look like. Tentatively, the plan uh, is for students to have, uh, you know, prepackaged grab and go type meals. Uh, we were actually literally this morning working with them on what the delivery would be, whether students walk down to, let's say, a kiosk to pick it up, if it's delivered to the classroom. So, you know, not all the details are fully formulated, but the basic plan is that the teachers would be um, uh, present in the classroom. The children would eat in their, in their classroom, okay, and teachers would be present for that. Uh, whether the, choose to, the teacher chooses to eat or not is, is up to him or her, but it's important that this does not count as the teacher's lunch. Since they're supervising children, that counts as a duty. So when I mentioned about the, uh, the you know, truncating the school day from seven hours to six hours, the reason being is that that quote teacher lunch, that 45 minute contractual teacher lunch will actually occur at the quote end of the school day after dismissal. And then the remaining 15 minutes of that hour will be the you know, for compensation for the 13 minutes that they would have missed from their prep time during the special, because remember they, they went from 43 minutes to 13. So we're still in alignment with all of the uh, contractual needs of the uh, teachers through the BEA. And we feel that this is, uh, you know, for the students to eat in a socially distant manner, to still have the camaraderie of kind of being around their friends, uh, but this way it's, it's much safer in that type of environment than obviously at cafeteria tables where they're facing each other. Oh, and uh, this is important as well, I should note this. Uh, you know, something that we're very proud of is, you know, uh, during the, the pandemic, we were still able to deliver uh, meals to the children, uh, you know, the, the free and reduced lunch families uh, in, in our community who need them. We recognize that there's a, a percentage of children who, uh, you know, might only get a, a warm, nutritious meal through the school. Um, we, we understand that, you know, there's a lot of challenges going on uh, in the world today. And unfortunately for some families, you know, they don't have the means to provide that. We feel very strongly about, you know, caring for children in all these different areas. And, and food service is, of course, one of them. So students will be given the opportunity to pick up meals for the days that they're not scheduled to attend class. So if I'm a hybrid or a full virtual, I still know that I can go to the school and get, you know, uh, get a meal if I, if I qualify for that. Recess, physical education. Okay. So we've taken an inventory of outdoor spaces. Again, credit to the principals and their logistical skills. They're uh, working on a schedule of cascading throughout the day. So instead of everyone going out for recess at the same time, say, you know, your 20 minute recess slot is, uh, you know, at this time, your 20 minute recess slot is at that time. So kids still get a chance to go out and play, uh, you know, and, and be kids. Um, and we're able to do that without overcrowding any one particular area. Uh, we do also want to note that, you know, we're, we're putting a tremendous emphasis on the social, emotional well-being, the wellness of children. Yes, school is, uh, you know, academics is, is a centerpiece, but it's not the only thing that we need to really be thinking about at this time. So that's the bullet that you see there. Special attention will be made to student social, emotional, and physical wellness to increase the likelihood of pupil self-care. Um, and, that, and that's just basically a fancy way of saying, you know, really emphasizing the kids and helping kids take care of themselves. Uh, during this time. Another important component of this plan because of concerns about locker rooms and proximity and things of that nature, uh, we are encouraging students to wear comfortable clothing and safe footwear to school um, so they can participate in physical education classes without the need to change. Extracurricular extra activities. Okay, so sports is something definitely on the top of everyone's mind. Um, I'm not gonna address it here other than just to say that that guidance does not come from us, that comes directly from the governing body, uh, the New Jersey State Interscholastic Athletics Association, <laughs> NJSIAA. Uh, they are the governing body of all high school sports and they are constantly updating. So that link there will take you to their COVID-19 you know, updates page. Um, and it's obviously changing you know, all the time with which sports are, are permitted and, and what, what uh, coaches are allowed to do with athletes. Uh, but, you know, look, there's a number of extracurricular activities that can run virtually, okay, and we'll plan to begin the year with them running virtually. A student government, National Honor Society, gaming clubs. We actually have a, a, an esports team now at the high school, um, Cyber Patriot, things of that, things of that nature. Um, so, you know, we want to provide as many opportunities to kids as we safely uh, can do. 
Um, importantly, and we know we have a, a lot of outside groups that do use our school facilities due to health and safety issues, external community organizations uh, will only be permitted to use outside venues. Social emotional learning, you've heard me mention that many times uh, throughout the presentation, along with academics. Those are really the, you know, the two cornerstones of what we're trying to accomplish with, with the children. Um, and I'd be remiss, you know, I, I say with the children, but also the educators. You know, this is tough for adults too. Yes, we're, we're focused on the kids primarily because that's what we're here for, uh, but we can't forget the staff. We can't forget the members of the community who are going through this tough time together. Um, and so their wellness is important too. So, you know, we've, we've acknowledged and prepared for potential trauma that staff and students face during uh, COVID-19. Uh, you know, we are uh, very fortunate to have a strong school counseling team led by Mrs. Leah Perperai. Um, so, so they're doing an excellent job in pre uh, preparing programs for students and staff. And I'm very excited by the work that's being done with our Professional Development Academy because we have the opportunity to put the resources and the supports in place to help the the teachers and the teaching staff members, the instructional, you know, certificated instructional staff members, um, and put them in a place to be successful. You know, we always joke that more and more is being asked uh, of educators every year. Well, <laughs> that's particularly true this year. Um, so I, I feel a very solemn responsibility to, as we're asking more of these people, for us to provide more, okay, as a district to support them in their work. Um, so the Professional Development Academy, just in case uh, for anyone who's not familiar, we're entering year three. Um, I want to thank Dr. Brian Latwis for bringing that vision and the board for supporting it. It is uh, professional development uh, by teachers for teachers in the sense that we have about 25 cohorts of staff members throughout the district. And uh, working with the, the PD Academy leadership team uh, and then we on the admin team identify modules that we feel uh, staff would really benefit from. So in other words, uh, year one, you go through a series, almost like college courses, of what does teaching and learning look like in Barnegat? What are the best practices that we really, you know, want our, our teachers to embrace? And really setting that foundation. Uh, year two is uh, a little, you know, building on that, becoming a little more complex, using data to drive instruction, everything we talked about with differentiation, standards-based analyses, things of that nature. Uh, and then now moving into year three, we've just begun uh, the planning for rolling out uh, year three, which is centered around executive functioning and helping students prom uh, promote their executive functioning skills, uh, organization, time management, focus, uh, uh, self-regulation. Those are the skills that are going to be extremely important for them to have, uh, you know, not just to be successful in life, but particularly for coping, um, you know, when dealing with the challenges of remote learning. So that's a little bit about the Professional Development Academy. And then as well, the student, uh, staff and student social emotional wellness will be embedded into the school day. Um, and that's something that, again, we really wanna keep coming back to as one of the themes. We're, we're here to support each other. We're here to support our kids. And multi-tiered system of supports. So this is something we're very excited about. Uh, Mr. Gunderson did a fantastic job with this uh, in his office last year. It's now migrating back to my office. Um, and that's something that we're excited about because again, it's just another way to help kids. It's a systematic approach to identifying kids who need support and then having these different tiers of support depending on, uh, you know, if, if you start at the lowest level of intervention, if that doesn't work, it becomes a little more intense, a little more intense, a little more intense. Um, and we really don't give up until kids, uh, you know, get the help that they need. So uh, I mentioned that you heard me say the words link it earlier. That is a third party vendor that provides uh, standards-based normed benchmarks. The quote Form C is the spring benchmark from last year. And the kids are going to take that in September, not for a grade, just for a diagnostic, because we need to know, hey, if Jimmy the fourth grader, yes, I finished third grade, but which third grade skills did I master? Which third grade skills and concepts am I so so on? And which third grade skills and concepts did I just not learn last year? Um, and, and we're able to get that information broken out very, you know, by curriculum content standard. And this provides a roadmap for teachers uh, individually in small group in their cohorts to identify and, and tailor their instruction to the needs of individual kids. And then if there are children who have really severe gaps, then we can move them along that pathway through these response to intervention. And ultimately the plan is provide targeted standards-based skill remediation for those students with those academic gaps. 
So uh, Mr. Gunderson and I have revised our three-year plans for um, the student services department and the curriculum department to be responsive and to be more in alignment with student needs given the current uh, situation. Wraparound supports. Um, uh, these are services and supports sort of outside the school day. Uh, the remote learning plan, uh, excuse me, the um, district reopening plan has a plethora of them listed there for you. I just have some of the different categories, uh, but we've done a great job in, in terms of identifying different resources and making them available to folks in this plan so that if, you, if, if a family is experiencing challenges with uh, you know, mental health uh, issues or COVID specific issues, or they're looking for you know, a mentor in their life, or childcare or things like that. You know, we do have a bunch of resources and stuff available there. Okay, in closing, the next steps. So uh, here we are, we are submitting this version of the plan to uh, the uh, Board of Education for formal approval of the July meeting. Please note it is a living document and you know, we do anticipate that if uh, guidance from the state or federal government uh, changes in the next coming weeks, then of course we will uh, need to change and amend the plan. Uh, so that we will continue monitoring those guidelines. Um, very excited, I'll be meeting on Thursday with um, uh, staff members who have signed up for the remote learning plan committee. Uh, so now that we have this plan, if it's board approved, uh, hopefully by the uh, uh, you know board tonight, uh, we'll then take this plan and use it as the uh, parameter, the structure, if you will, for a remote learning committee, uh, because from feedback from the board, you know we uh, are feeling, um, the need to provide, I'll say some guidelines or some parameters for staff to ensure some consistency. Uh, I think our staff did an amazing job uh, last spring. Again, that was very reactive. None of us you know, uh, anticipated, <laughs> when we started the school year last year, none of us anticipated this coming. Uh, but now that we can be proactive, we feel it's incumbent and in, in, uh, you know, credit to the board to have the foresight to establish this, um, these parameters for expectations for uh, what does high quality teaching and learning look like in a remote environment. So that will be the work of the Remote Learning Plan Committee. They'll be creating detailed guidance for teachers, support for teachers in the K4, 5.8, and 9.12 bands. And then of course, everything we said with the Professional Development Academy to provide that additional layer and pillar of support. So that's the work that we have in the coming weeks. I'm sure you have many, many questions. Um, I wanna thank you for your attention. Um, thank you for putting up with the terrible jokes and thank you to Kelly West for getting the computer working. Um, so uh, I'm going to turn the mic back to Dr. Lawis and the Board of Education and thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Barbieri. We appreciate the uh, detailed presentation. Um, at this point, I would just like to open the floor to any board members if they might have questions for Mr. Barbieri before he sits down in regards to the plan. Okay, we'll move right along into committee reports. Thanks again, Mr. Barbieri. Up first will be Finance Committee, Mr. Geddes. Okay, uh, good evening. The Finance Committee met on uh, July 16th. Uh, some of the topics we discussed uh, was uh, regarding insurance related payments. Uh, for the district during the closure of the COVID-19 in the springtime. Um, we also discussed the before and after care program, uh, the length of the contract and the RFP review process that was uh, done. Uh, addition, the co committee discussed uh, several uh, of the revenue accounts, uh, sp specifically regarding the Bengal Cubs and the before and after care programs, which were uh, no longer uh, functioning uh, under the uh, district uh, oversight uh, and what are the accounting procedures behind that. Um, uh, there is a policy, uh, I believe it's in the governance uh, approval tonight regarding uh, inter uh, board meeting uh, payments for uh, certain priority items. Um, Additionally, we discussed the ESIP program. I believe there's a motion as well regarding that um, and, and talking about the uh, potential uh, use of savings going forward. And that is all. Okay, thank you, Mr. Geddes. Up next will be buildings and ground, Mr. Sherman. Well, good evening. 
We had our uh, facility use and building and grounds meeting on July 15th. We have one motion approved for approval for tonight. The energy savings improvement plan. We hired the energy audit firm of CHA to conduct an energy audit. They will be working with our architectural firm of Spiesel Architectural Group. We will be working on lowering energy costs at all buildings in the district. Our business administrator in indicated that the district will restrict facility use to outside only. <clears throat> no use of buildings will be permitted until further notice. The outside above storage tank is progressing as planned. We started the alterations of the sixth grade uh, science classes at the Horbelt. And our, our facility supervisor has installed plexiglass in all the main offices of each school. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sherman. Next will be Mrs. Pereira uh, with a report from the Education Committee. Hi, everybody. Um, the Education Committee met, I don't know what day, but we met. I've lost track of day, sorry, everybody. <clears throat> we have a motion on the agenda tonight to add a reading program for our multiple disability students called Reading Mastery, Corrective Reading and Connecting Math Concepts. Although we have some excellent programs for our everyday classrooms on reading and math programs, our multiple disabilities programs were lacking because they weren't geared toward multiple disability students. So our special ed teachers were always trying to adjust and add and change and alter what was given to them to make it fit better for their students. <clears throat> the programs we're adding are designed for multiple disability students and will serve them a lot better. So that's something we're adding. Uh, we also have a motion for um, the internships that our multiple disability students are offered from businesses in our community. Um, each year we have a list of businesses that are approved. We have the same thing this year, except of course, we don't know how that will look moving forward with the restrictions. However, the businesses are approved. So when the time comes and all is safe, the students can move into those businesses and get hands-on experience in working in our communities for us. We had our regular college university placements, our continuing education requests, and our out-of-district workshops. Um, those were the motions, but of course we had uh, lengthy discussions on the reopening plan. We had questions answered about different ways that would go. So that was quite a long discussion during the meeting. And that was about it for this month. Thank you, Mrs. Pereira. Up next will be Ms. Continenza with Governance Committee. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, we met on July 9th. Um, the first motion is to approve a job description for human resource coordinator. This is a title change to realign the job descriptions within the office. Motion two is the HIB um, yearly cumulative report for 2019-20 school year. This is a yearly report that's done every year. Motions three and four are first reading for adoption of policies and regulations. Motion five is the reopening plan for the September 2020. Um, I'd just like to take a moment since it's on the governance committee. Um, I'd like to thank, um, to express my thanks to all the people involved in putting together this reopening plan. The time and effort that was put into this plan can certainly be measured by this end result. Um, the governance committee received this plan to vote on tonight and um, as with any plan that the committees receive, it is after all the hard work behind the scenes that have been done. So again, I'd like to thank Dr. Latwis and his team, the teachers, the parents, and the input, the parents' input that helped create this reopening plan. So thank you very much. Um, motion six is school health closure plan. Um, that's the plan that we used for the March, from March to July, 2020. 
And also on governance is the revised school um, calendar. So um, Dr. Latwis, I know you're probably gonna speak more about this, but the parent, it outlines group one and group two and on uh, the days they come in person. And we also revised um, a PD day. Um, we moved it to Friday, which is their virtual day. And thank you, that's it. Okay, and uh, Ms. Sarno's not here this evening. Um, can you please do the HST committee sure. as well? Thanks. <laughs> okay, um, we met on July 14th. Uh, Paul Canizaro, um, whose name is close to mine, <laughs> um, from Pitbull uh, Secure Technologies gave us an update on the education initiatives that will drive the IT process. The committee also discussed the opening of the school district, um, the technology needs for the district, and, and of course, for virtual learning. And um, the committee also reviewed the safety grant that has been submitted. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Continanza. Up next is uh, personnel. Uh, we met last week. Uh, the primary stuff that we were discussing uh, was uh, stipends for summer work and for activities next year. Um, we had a group of new hires, so congratulations to all the people who are on the agenda this time around uh, for your selection to the district and your uh, upcoming school year. Uh, we wish you the best. Um, also, I would like to take a second to recognize Mrs. De Deanna Bato for uh, her retirement. Um, and that's basically otherwise with personnel committee it was a routine uh, meeting, just basically preparing um, and adding extra hours to get summer work done to put ourselves in the best possible position to have a successful year. Up next would be uh, the grade banding committee. Um, although we don't have any motions on the agenda this time around, we did review the uh, project management plan in depth. I'm happy to report that uh, we are still ahead of schedule and budget um, in uh, probably more than 95% of the areas to include curriculum, transportation, and the move, which were the areas I think were of uh, the highest concern to the board and uh, the community. Otherwise, uh, Mr. Deemer is here this evening. He is the chairperson for the uh, Citizens Advisory Committee. Um, they did meet twice over the last month, and he will provide an update to the Board of Education on the progress. Mr. Deemer, thank you. Good evening, board members. Uh, since the last DOE meeting, our CSC has met twice. Uh, we, were, uh, we are anxiously awaiting the reopening plan for approval. Hopefully, it happens tonight. Um, our last meeting uh, pertained mostly to uh, discussing some parts of the uh, reopening plan and getting any feedback from that. Uh, previously, we also um, reopened the idea of possibly trying to hold the student plan that was uh, ready for practice for last year. And with the help of uh, Ms. Continanza, uh, we're looking at uh, using uh, Barney 67's outdoor space uh, to possibly have it, but no one can be something called all the proper uh, health protocols and so forth. But the kids work really hard, so. Uh, we're trying to find a way to put that on if we can. Um, in addition, one more recommend one of our recommendations uh, came out the principal's uh, release has taken to a memo to the parents recently. Uh, that was from the CAC's, uh, uh, from the CAC's uh, recommendations. Um, you should see some other memos coming out here in the near future. Uh, Google Classroom or Google Meet uh, for all the kids uh, and uh, some transportation stuff as well. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Deemer. Um, I'd also like to relay the board's appreciation to the Citizens Advisory Committee for all of the great recommendations that have been coming out. So for any of the uh, members that may be on the Zoom call this evening, um, it's very much appreciated. So that brings us to President's remarks and comments. I'm going to keep it brief tonight. We do have quite the crowd, and uh, this meeting is going to end up being a little bit longer than normal. Um, but number one, I wanted to take a moment to thank everybody that participated in the reopening task force. Uh, when Governor Murphy put out his 104-page guidance document, I'd say within minutes, the administration was already digesting it, tearing it apart, breaking it down, um, doing what we call in the military mission analysis. Um, and they started working right through that process right off the bat to kind of uh, make 
the best possible plan. Um, and prioritizing staff and student safety is the number one thing that we saw in that plan. Um, I can assure you that um, unanimously this board is looking out for that number one priority, staff and student safety. Um, number two, um, that plan addresses the best possible outcomes that this administration could, could put together. Um, for our students going into this year, given the restraints and the limitations that we are dealt with right now, um, the, the biggest thing is that it seems like in throughout the community that um, there is some um, dissatisfaction, no matter what, what way you would like to see it go, all in person, virtual, or, um, you know, the combination or hybrid model. Um, but I'm telling you right now that this administration and, and the board was not willing to sacrifice anything uh, revolving around staff and student safety. Um, some of the other districts that have implemented a full-time return to school, I can assure you that those plans are not um, fit for this district and they wouldn't work where we can ensure student safety and ensure the safety of our staff. Next, uh, I just wanted to address something about the wraparound services and the social emotional support. Um, for all the parents that are on the call um, and for all the members of the board, um, I would just ask that if you do find yourselves facing any problems with the reopening plan, the district is absolutely open to feedback. First and foremost, address it with your teachers in your classroom, bring it to your building administrators, and then if you're still not finding um, the relief or, or your needs are being met, make sure you bring it to Dr. Latwis on in his team. Additionally, if you have comments that aren't maybe a fit for those channels, you can directly address through the one Barnegat um, email, one Barnegat at barnegatschools.com. Uh, that email is monitored by several administrators and they will begin addressing your problems immediately. And lastly, I just wanna say that um, the administration has really put together uh, tons of resources. If you or your family or a family that you know is finding yourself in a situation where um, you may be not dealing well with the situation or you find your child falling behind, reach out. Reach out to your teacher, reach out to your building administrator, and, and, and don't be too proud to ask for help because there are so many services throughout the community, whether it's CTC or the Oasis Center or this district, that nobody should be for want of anything. Um, we've had several families with some very tough problems and we we're able to help and address their situations and bring them along. So uh, that's all I have for President's remarks this evening. Up next would be a uh, public session. Board of Education appreciates and welcomes public comment, advice and suggestions, especially when it's intended to assist the Board of Education. Please feel free to speak to the board during the public session. Comments and discussions will be limited to one five minute period per individual unless requested by the chairperson to continue on a point of clarification. Public comment at special meetings of the board shall be related to the call of the meeting in accordance with the open public, sorry, in accordance with Board of Education policy, each participant must be recognized by the presiding officer and must preface their comments by an announcement of the name, address, and group affiliation if appropriate. If you're anticipated courtesy to the members of the public and the board is appreciated. All right, looking for a motion to enter public session. So moved. Second. Second. Uh, Ms. Contenanza. Yes. Mr. Geddes. Yes. Mr. O'Brien. Yes. Mrs. Pereira. Yes. Mr. Quelch. Yes. Mr. Zwicky. Yes. Mr. Sherman? Yes. And Mr. Higgins? Yes. All right, we're in public session at 741. Okay, I would just like to cover some ground rules. Number one, if you'd like to be uh, addressed, um, please um, put your name and your address and your group affiliation into the chat window. Or if somebody locally would like to be addressed, please raise your hand. I'll start with uh, the gentleman in the back, Mr. Junker. William Junker, is this on? Can you guys hear me? We can hear you. Thank you, sir. William Junker, I'm the president of the Barnegat Education Association. Um, I do have a statements, not using my style. I, I figured with everything that's going on, 
um, to best serve the board, um, the team that was I was on working to build the plan and all of our staff and students. I wanted to write something for this. I didn't want to go off the cuff like I usually do. So bear with me because I'm going to kind of read it to you guys. Um, in Barnegat, we've been ahead of the guidelines, closings, and cleanings, and the recommendations from state and federal agencies, and we should continue to do so. We've been ahead since day one. We closed before everyone else did. Um, we've been way ahead with cleaning, and we shouldn't stop there. Our plan currently is one of the best in the county. I know that because I've looked at county plans, and I firmly feel our plan is one of the best in the state. And I know that because being the president, I've been a privy to other plans in the state of New Jersey. Um, I think there's something missing in our plan. Um, I know we're doing a good job with social distancing, but I, I think we should add um, masks as a full-time requirement. Um, we should have masks on door to door from the bus stop, on the bus, into the building, throughout the time in the building. We have to work on lunches, obviously. I understand that piece until they leave. Um, Accommodation should be made, obviously, for those students, special education students as well. We have to look at accommodations for those kids um, that are unable to wear coverings. Uh, but we all know medical experts, including the CDC, have definitively stated that this virus spreads through droplets released by infected individuals. According to CDC, the virus is spreading very easily, and we can see that right now, that it is spreading again very easily when we open things up. Um, there's also mounting evidence, according to the, the World Health Organization, that it also may be spread by tiny particles spent in the air. Mr. Barbieri talked about that thing that we were talking about with the study um, that I've looked at for, I guess that one was actually longer than the one that came from the state of New Jersey. I think it was 199 pages, something like that, right, Jim, um, about the arts and droplets. Um, cloth masks are considered as the absolute necess necess necessary to minimize the spread. In addition, there's been some recent reliable studies that I've shared with our district um, and have shown that children ages 10 and up um, pass the virus as easily as adults do. We should take that into consideration because like i said we've been ahead of the curve here in barnegat we were way ahead and i've been applauding that from the beginning and i've been reiterating that with our staff when they ask questions to me as the president we've been ahead don't worry we've been ahead we're planning um our teachers our staff within the classrooms cannot be expected to maintain the social distance at all times and nor should the students for that matter um, how can how will a teacher move from desk to desk to help students one-on-one without this full-time mass requirement I'm a special education teacher with a small class all the time, and I'm always well within that CDC guideline, all times working with my students. Very rarely I'm at my desk. I'm always breaking that, that bubble. How can we expect our staff, our students to feel comfortable in the classroom without that requirement? Um, masks are currently a full-time requirement in every building in New Jersey. You go into Home Depot, go into ShopRite, you have to wear a mask. We can't have dinner yet. We can't go to the gym. I'm shrinking. <laughs> Why are our schools any different? Why are we sitting here making a plan, which I, again, will applaud? Why is our plan any different than what we're seeing in, in, in the real world when we go to shop, right? Providing these basic health and well being for the students and staff is the foundation upon all school reopening plans. Um, Mass are the minimum level. And, and we, we never provide a minimum leverage on Barnegat. I, I, you guys all know I was a Barnegat student. I've been a Barnegat teacher for I don't know how many years now. We never provide a minimum level here. We have always been working to be better and provide a maximum level. We should be providing the maximum level to these kids. And again, I'm not bashing our plan. I don't want anyone to misinterpret that. I think our plan is amazing that we're not bringing 100% students in. But I think we can do a little more. Um, I applaud our plan. But one infection is, is, is not acceptable. One infection is one too many. And that goes for staff and students. I stand here not just representing our staff as the president, but as students as well. One infection is no good. As president, I've heard about infections that are taking place in our state right now during ESY. And that's not acceptable. That's not acceptable to me. Um, I'm begging you guys to stay ahead of the guidelines. Dr. Latwis, our admin team, everyone that's on this committee from the day one has been ahead. I urge you guys to stay ahead. I know the challenges that saying that brings. I understand those challenges. Making people wear masks 100% of the time, our students. I understand those challenges, but I think we can overcome those challenges and make those teachable moments. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Junker. I'm going to take the next one online. Uh, would be Mr. Fedorsik of 131 Rock Rim and Boulevard. Mr. Fedorsik, please unmute and address the board. 
Uh, can you all hear me? Yep, loud and clear. All right. I apologize for not uh, being present today. Fortunately, I had to uh, run out to work, so it's live from Lair State Park. Uh, I completely agree with the sentiments of Mr. Junker. Uh, couldn't have uh, echoed those uh, any better than he had. Uh, Dr. Lawes, I did send you a text message a short while ago because I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to uh, get on the call. Uh, one of the concerns that came up from the community, like literally within the last, say, 24 to 48 hours, is as far as the hybrid plan, was there any thought, and I don't believe it was ever brought up in the CAC, uh, the, the Community Advisory Committee, as far as I recall, was there a reason why we went Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, as opposed to having the same set of students in on Monday, Tuesday, doing the all virtual on Wednesday to allow for a deep cleanse, and then doing Thursday, Friday with the second set, allowing those students to remain in there, you know, basically maximize their time in there, reducing some of the, uh, the, the move around and change o over a couple of days. Uh, that, was, that was the only uh, the question uh, that I had. Uh, just to bring up, you know, not more or less for me, but for, uh, you know, for the public. Uh, the other item that I have is just really a comment, and this is for everybody in the board. Uh, I actually had a, a short conversation with Mr. Geddes today out, out in our uh, development uh, regarding the reopening. I am on board with our reopening plan. I think we've done a great job up to this point, uh, at the very least, looking through the details, taking the input, and getting that feedback from, from the administration, at least on the, the community advisory committee side. Uh, but the reality of it is like Mr. Junker said, this thing is still spreading and I come from what, not necessarily my personal opinion, but out in the open, if we're being told that this disease is spread as easily as possible, is any type of in-person really the safe option at this point? I myself am electing to send my, both of my children to school. I'm comfortable with it, but I know, I know there's a lot in the community that aren't so just when it comes time for the vote on that, just please, I'm sure you already have, just think long and hard about it. Just let's make that right decision. Because like Mr. Junker said, one infection is too many. Um, but like I said, I just had the question regarding the uh, the days why for the hybrid days. Uh, that is all. Cut. Sure. So I can jump in on that. So uh, it was uh, discussed briefly at the uh, reopening task force uh, committee level, the uh, decision to go uh, break the students up into the Monday, uh, Wednesday, and the Tuesday, Thursday uh, was geared more towards uh, best practice. So we didn't want to have a situation where students would have that in-person instruction back back days and then not have that uh, in-person instruction or feedback for five days and, and kind of go back and forth. Um, we wanted that Friday to be virtual. Uh, so really the students uh, outside of the weekends, obviously, never really went more than a day without getting feedback on what they were doing. So the mindset behind the in-person instruction is that they can learn a new skill and then uh, they would have their extension activity day and then it would go back to in-person so that you had that consistency of having the in-person back and forth to field questions, answer, uh, answer questions, field questions, and, uh, and to model for the students. As far as the deep clean on a Wednesday versus the Friday, uh, to be quite honest with you, the cleaning procedures are the cleaning procedures, and, and they they do the full disinfecting um, at the conclusion of each day. So there there really isn't a major uh, adjustment to the cleaning procedures, um, to my knowledge, uh, based on uh, each night versus just uh, just having that one that one day. Um, so I hope that answers the question there. As far as the uh, is the uh, any in person a good idea? Uh, we. We were given that road back plan um, where we were told that we had to stay within those parameters and to build a plan around those parameters. Uh, so the in-person instruction, uh, and again, this is a living document because as we've seen from the governor's office can change at any time. Um, but the guidance that was given is really trying to prioritize getting students uh, out of the house and back into um, the schools and, and resuming some level of uh, normalcy or some sense of normalcy. So I uh, hope that answers your question as far as the, uh, the day breakdown, why that uh, was decided. Um, and then I just wanted to touch upon your other your other statement. Thank you, Dr. Lawis. I do appreciate it. Like I said, uh, I think we have a great plan going forward. At, you know, and I, I do echo what Mr. Junker said. Probably one of the better ones. And we're going to sit here and watch uh, Southern Regional and see what happens if they end up going full. So it's I, I think we're good. Thank you for your time. Thanks, George. Thank you, Mr. Fedorsik. Uh, Ma'am, in the back next to Mr. Junker, um, I saw you had raised your hand earlier. 
Good evening, Trisha Garkowski, 4014 away, Barnegat. What else would you like me to? Oh, no, that's it. Just your name and address okay. or if you had a group affiliation. Okay. Um, my son is a student in Barnegat. Thank you. Okay, I'm extremely nervous because I don't like public speaking, but I felt compelled to come here this evening. I'm listening. I'm trying to be respectful. I appreciate that a lot of time and effort was put into this. However, the glaring thing to me is that there was no option for full-time returning to school, and I, I just don't understand the rationale why. I'd, I'd like an answer to that. Um, I heard a lot tonight about what the plan is, but what was the rationale for the plan that we were only provided with an option that they could attend either virtually or with a hybrid model. And I did read the governor's guidelines and according to the guidelines, the six foot distancing is not mandatory. It's highly suggested, but not mandatory. Um, I don't know. Sure, so I could, I could touch upon that. So. Um, it was the uh, it was really the overwhelming belief that the task force that came together to create the plan um, that we wanted to prioritize the student and, and staff safety. Um, if you uh, you know you said you mentioned you went through the plan. If you looked in there, it, the the nature of the plan was uh, reduced capacity. Um, they gave three different models that they they offered. It was week uh, like a week on week off, alternating days, or like broken into three groups and then rotating through uh, those three groups, but. The overall, the message that uh, was loud and clear when he gave his live address to address the plan, as well as the actual, the road bike guidance was the idea that the, to have limited capacity, to try to reduce capacity in the buildings, um, to, to maintain that socially distancing, uh, maintain the socially distancing, um, and really trying to prioritize the, the safety of the students. So uh, to be quite honest, that out of the entire panel, uh, nobody advocated to, to, um, go against the governor's guidance and to bring students back full time. Well, the governor's guidance as of yesterday, he said that children should be returning to school. Correct. And the CDC, because I heard the CDC quoted, the CDC says that children should return to school full time. American Academy of Pediatrics says that children should be returning to school full time. So that's what I'm quoting, and I implore the board to not approve this. It's not right for our students. And to suggest that... Uh, you know, the other, the other districts that are opening full-time, that they're not doing what's right for the children, or to imply that I, as a mother, if I feel my child should go back full-time, that somehow I, that's negligent on my part, I take offense to that. I implore you not to approve this plan. Okay, I, and so. also, I, I'm sorry, um, at the flexibility. At what point are we going to revisit this? When When will anybody feel safe? I mean... It's a virus. And as far as um, I, something that I listened to regarding um, when the children are in school, if they show symptoms, I mean, the common cold shows symptoms of a cough or a sneeze. I mean, are we going to play this game where every, a child coughs or sneezes? They're going to be taken into a room and judged for COVID? I feel like this is lunacy and I hate to be hypocritical, but I look around the room here and I notice that we're not six foot distance. People are wearing masks. People are not wearing masks. Sometimes they're up. Sometimes they're down. I'm not trying to judge anyone. It's just the truth. And uh, this is just all nonsense in my view. It's nonsense. Sure. And, and I, and as far as the, the guidance, the guidance that the school district has to follow is, is from the governor's office. So I appreciate some of those other bodies have come forward and I've, to be honest, I've read a lot of conflicting things from both sides that, that you know, clearly articulate on both ends. I mean, Mr. Junker, uh, at his statement, cited CDC that said quite the opposite of what you're saying right well, now. I, so, I, so hold on, let me finish. Mm -hmm, so, sure. um, you know, as far as the, uh, uh, the, the full time and, and having all the students back and having 22 students back in the classroom with a teacher and, and having the students uh, with the proximity that they would have if you had the full students back, um, I don't think that was in the nature of what the governor's uh, guidance that came out. Um, as far as, I, unless somebody knows anything different than me, I'm pretty sure the executive order still stands that uh, buildings are supposed to be at 25% capacity and that might go up to 50% capacity. Um, at no point did I imply that any other district was negligent in what they're doing. If they're able to safely do it, that's, that's great. Um, as far as what we were able to do when we were looking at our building, our enrollment, our you know, average classroom size, things of that nature, Nobody felt that it was a. What is the average whatever. classroom size? The uh, average classroom size is about twenty-two students. 22 no, no, no. I'm sorry. Students. The dimensions of an average classroom—that's what I mean. 
the as far as like the, the how we can configure the desks that the children can sit safely. So, so to, to distance them six feet apart, it was about 12 or 13 students would be, I mean, maxing out. No, no, no. I'm sorry. I'm asking what are the actual dimensions of a typical classroom, the size? I, I would have to. No one knows I don't that? Know, I don't know what the actual the dimensions of classroom size is. I'd be, cur I'd be very curious to know that. I'm sorry? On a regular between 700 and 900 square feet as an actual classroom. Okay. Because I'd like to do the math when I get home. <laughs> no I'm just, at, at what, at what, so at what point will we revisit this? So if this it's living, passed, and I hope it's not. This is, a, this is a living document. We can change it or alter it at any time, depending on the guidance changing or as a district, if we decide to pivot in a different direction. Okay, so you won't recognize that the CDC has, a, has um, acknowledged that children should go back to school full time? The you CDC, haven't heard that? The CDC doesn't provide, doesn't give the guidance. to the, the guidance that we would get that we have to build this plan around comes from the governor's office. Okay, and the governor yesterday, as of yesterday, he announced that he thinks the children should be going back to school. And if the governor's office provides this guidance, it says that we can have the, all the students He's back leaving it up to the individual districts. The, the road back plan, there was nowhere in there that it say that we should have all the students back at the same and time. And it also doesn't say that you shouldn't. That's, that actually that's my three point. Models. The, the, the three models that were, that were in there is exactly what I just described to you. It was A, B, it was week on, week off, or it was a three-day rotation. And this, and he, you're, so you're saying right now that the governor has is not allowing anyone to go back to school full time. I have no idea what the governor is going to do or not do, but what we're so, doing, we're, we based no, our. No, I, I understand what you're time. saying, but my point is, I, I think what you you're trying to tell me that the reason that there were only two options is that that's what the governor provided for. The two options were what the task force felt were the the best two options that we could put forth. So it's not what the governor provides. For the governor will allow full-time students returning in, in full. Uh, my time is up. No. I implore you not to vote on this to approve it. Ma'am, thank you for your comments. Um, I would just ask if you could uh, put an email or a phone number so that we can reach back out to you. I'd like to have you continue the conversation with the administration. Um, you know, despite your time being up at this point, um, I don't think the conversation was over. So we'd like to continue to address your concerns. Thank you. All right, we'll go uh, back online. Uh, Mr. Daly from Two Wood Woodmere Court, if you're still with us, uh, please unmute and address the board. Hey, good evening, everybody. Thanks for uh, thanks for entertaining my words. Um, Mr. Barberi, that was quite a presentation. Thank you so much for that. Can you all hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent. Great, okay. Um, hey, uh, when my wife and I moved here in uh, year 2000, uh, it was because of the sense of community that we found here. And I think that you're, Reopening uh, proposal really embodies that sense of community and, a, and an attempt to to bring everybody together in a safe way. Um, so I applaud you for that. And I thank you for all of your hard work on that. Um, it works for me. I understand that it probably doesn't work for everybody, as was witnessed by the lady that just spoke before me. And, and, I, and I, you know, I feel for that. I feel for those who, for whom it doesn't work. Um, I, uh, I have a couple quick questions. Um, will uh, virtual students be held to the same class schedule as those uh, in class? And uh, secondly, will a student be able to move from full virtual to hybrid mid-year if, uh, if the family feels that conditions have changed? So yes, I can address the two. So the uh, second one is the uh, easier of the two. So yes, a family can decide whether they want to go back and forth um, based on, on, their, on their comfort level. Uh, we did, uh, uh, again, as Mr. Barbieri discussed when we broke down the class list, uh, we did so with the mindset that we wanted to establish the same class list for students that were virtual or in person uh, to provide them that option of seamless transition if they, want, if, uh, if they felt like their situation changed or they felt uh, their comfort level changed and they wanted to go either direction. Uh, the virtual platform and the in-person platform are gonna follow um, uh, basically the same content of the week, the same standards are going to be taught. There's going to be a standardization of that. Um, as far as the virtual students following along, uh, we are exploring right now the option of having the uh, teacher's laptops, um, their Chromebooks uh, that they'll be getting uh, on so that they could, uh, they could uh, any student at any time could tune in and, and see what the live instruction is going on. Uh, we have to be very ca uh, careful and cautious that that does not include any students uh, to violate any, obviously, uh, privacy rights. Um, but the, the board and whatnot will be um, accessible for a student that wants to log in. 
The Friday schedule for everybody is meant to be a very structured schedule, specific time to log in and interact with the regular classmate, uh, with the rest of the class, um, whether they're hybrid or virtual or they're group one or group two. And uh, one of the plans that we had as far as um, operating pretty much every classroom through a Google Classroom platform is providing uh, our teachers providing, um, you know, uh, uh, lessons where they model a specific standard um, on the board and then kind of work through with some practice uh, assignments so that students that are home that are working on a standard that's being taught that day, um, they can log in and see and see live what's going on. Uh, but what we're uh, what a student could also rely on is the ability to then access those uh, videos that will be modeled uh, that our staff will provide um, uh, as far as walking somebody through how to do a practice problem or a specific uh, uh, standard or skill. Um, so we are trying to attack this from a couple different angles uh, for students that are virtual to still feel like they're included in the classroom, get live, uh, live feedback um, or get live instruction in real time. Um, and we are trying to hammer out what those expectations and whatnot will look like um, because it, it, it is not going to be the same experience for a virtual child as uh, obviously being um, in school brick and mortar, uh, but we are trying to remove as many barriers as possible so that a student that is virtual uh, for, for any particular reason uh, does have an appropriate level of support and guidance. Excellent. Thank you so much. I appreciate uh, your recognition that this needs to be a live document as well and that it can move and that it should move as, uh, as we learn about uh, COVID and, and what we can do about it. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great night. You too. Take care. Thank you, Mr. Daly. I appreciate the comments and the questions. Uh, anybody in-house would like to go? Yes, ma'am. Nancy Schoenberg, 8 Magner. I have a daughter in seventh grade. A lot of my stuff was answered through everybody else. But um, I guess basically um, I just have two other questions. And I want to know if it's mandatory that the child goes on Google Meet at any particular time, or are you leaving that to you know the option of the child to go on? Because that's how it was in the past. And I just want to make sure that the students are being held accountable to be online at a certain time to you know do that. Everything was kind of, you know, but we all, you know, went along with it, but I know things are going to be different coming up. So is it mandatory for them to go on at any particular time if they were to stay home virtually? Sure. So we are looking to um, get a little bit more guidance from the state as far as what uh, attendance would look like. We've been told up to this point that it's hold harmless. Um, we are looking to have a much more structured schedule than we did in, in, in spring. In spring, there was a lot of like, obviously, it was kind of reactive. Nobody expected this was going to happen. Um, and we were trying to, uh, you know, navigate that with as much uh, empathy and flexibility and sympathy to each individual person's uh, situation. A lot of the feedback that we did get when we tried to hold students to specific times and whatnot was parents were coming back saying like older siblings were helping younger siblings during that time that there was other th there was other factors. So, you know, we are trying to walk a delicate line where we don't want to be punitive and 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 you know, hurt a child academically that has a valid reason why maybe they're not logging in at that specific time. Mm -hmm. But we are looking to provide a lot more structure with um, that as concerned. So the Friday all virtual day will have a set schedule for students that are expected to log in and, and participate. Mm -hmm. um, that's probably the, I would say, probably the most stringent um, uh, day out of all of it for the login day. The students that are doing the in um, uh, those read days, mm -hmm. uh, they can log in if they want to watch, like I said, the the, the computer that's going to be at the uh, basically face towards the board in case they want to see the lesson again, or they want to, they maybe have additional questions or they want to whatever, um, they will have that opportunity to do that. The days that they're logging in to just kind of watch what the teacher's doing are going to be a little bit more lax, I would imagine, um, as far as what the expectation uh, um, of a student specifically logging in at a specific time. Um, the Google Classroom is going to be ran more towards um, providing those support videos uh, that go over a specific standard, uh, putting the work on there for students to participate that directly relates to the standard that was just taught. Um, and those videos are gonna mirror really what the teacher's doing in live um, instruction. So, um, you know, for me, we're trying to be somewhat flexible with the students that so they can participate in the best way that they feel. Um, so it's really gonna be up to the child if they feel maybe it's more impactful for them to watch the instructional video that might be 15 or 20 minutes on a specific standard versus live streaming into a classroom where there's no, you know, if the teacher's off helping somebody else, they're just going to be staring at a blank board. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So 
we don't want teachers to sit at their desk and completely just, you know, um, focus on the laptop. So to answer your question, you know, we do have uh, teachers that we are bringing in uh, to work with the administration to put together a resource and guidance document for the staff that'll really outline a lot more of this mm -hmm. um, and, and give the staff that support on exactly what the expectation is and, and really kind of walk them through exactly what will need to be done and, and provide and provide assistance. Um, but as far as what you're talking about with the the trying to hold accountable, the Fridays will really be the day that's going to be a strict, you know, if it's 805, your class meets, we're expecting that you're going to log in at 805. And okay. those other days, it's going to be a little bit more loose as far as when they can log in or not. Okay. Um, similar to what we did in the spring, uh, a big part of what we're going to do to hold the students accountable is really going to be over the participation of the, the work and the assignments, what they're handing in, what they're providing feedback, how they're interacting with the teacher. Some good ideas were coming up as far as how we could potentially keep attendance in a creative way. That might be like a question of the day that you have to log in and answer at the same time. So there's a few things like that that are getting kicked around right now and trying to finalize as far as giving the teachers that, that kind of standard operating procedure. Um, but to answer your question as far as the logins, Friday will be very structured. The other day is probably a little bit more loose. Okay. And are they going to be changing classrooms? Or are uh, they going to be staying in the one uh, middle school? At the middle school and high school, they will be changing classrooms. They uh, will be. Yes, and they'll be sanitizing. Uh, the teachers will be taking part in sanitizing the classroom before the next group comes in. Mm -hmm. And there'll be wipes and stuff like that available for, let's say, a student that decides, like, hey, I want to wipe down the desk before I get in there. There'll be that ability for that, too. But don't forget, that the, the classrooms will still be outfitted with the same amount of desks as if everybody was there and showed up. Okay. So you will have that flexibility of alternating even the desks that students sit in. So if you're going to go with these rows, I would imagine if I was a teacher and I had the six rows, I might use these three for the first group that's coming through and then use these three for the second group while I sanitize and let it uh, disinfect. Um, this procedure is actually not that um, foreign to the district. The pre-K program, actually part of their requirements, mandates that they disinfect uh, the equipment and the desks and stuff like that throughout the day regularly. Mm -hmm. um, so we actually have a protocol in place where staff have disinfected the desks and things like that. We're really utilizing that to, man to now do it basically pre-K to 12. Okay. And um, see my notes here. So will they be going to their lockers? Uh, so that's something that I, I think at this point we're still trying to, to, to lock in. But I right now we're moving towards no, they will be, in the hallways. Yeah, no, we're not looking for at this point. We're not looking for them to have access to their, their lockers. OK. And virtual training, will they be able to participate in sports? Um, so the sports at this point is getting completely dictated uh, through what we're getting from NJSIAAAAAAA. -A 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 -A. Um, so at this point, they are. Um, they do have a plan for rolling out sports and participation in sports. We are following that at this point. Mm -hmm. And even the individual practices and, and stuff like that have their own safety protocols that they have to follow as far as temperature, ta uh, taking temperatures throughout and stuff like that. Um, so we are planning on following their guidance. If they're going to allow it, then we're going to continue to allow it. Mm -hmm. um, but right now we're, we're, we're basically, that even seems to be kind of like a, um, you know, in jeopardy given some of the local, so not some not so much local districts, but some of the other districts that are starting to experience some issues with the sports and athletics. So we'll see how that goes. But right now there is a plan in place. The guidance hasn't changed and we are following along with the guidance for sports. So will we know before I make the decision in September of virtual or? Uh, sports? Yeah. Uh, well, even if you're a virtual student, you still should, you still would have the opportunity. You still have the opportunity. Sports. Okay. That's basically, yeah. all right. That's yeah, yeah. You're not prohibited uh, if you want to participate in a sport versus um, a lot of their, the sports seem to be broken down into low risk and high risk based on, I guess, the number of con uh, contacts. So like mm -hmm. soccer, football, things like that would be high contact. That'd be high risk. Mm -hmm. The low risk ones like, you know, tennis, golf, you know, things like that. Like I could totally see a parent that may be fearful of having their kid in the indoors classroom, mm -hmm. um, but maybe feel comfortable with their kid outdoors on a tennis court. So okay. yeah, we're not, we, if you participate virtually, you still have the option to participate in sports. My daughter's in dance, so that would rely on whether or not there's basketball games and football games. Very so true. if there's no, you know, then there wouldn't be a sport then, they basically. Yeah, right now they are. As far as I know, unless something's changed, uh, what it's looking like right now is that they still are planning on having those sports. I think okay. October 2nd is the kickoff for football and some of those other ones. So right now they're still planning on, on having those. I haven't heard anything different. But okay. like I said, you look at some of the other towns that have had um, little mini outbreaks and things like that. They've started to cancel some of the, uh, the youth sports and things like that because they didn't want to have those. Those uh, They started to see like a breakout in their community and that was their decision to kind of pivot away from it. Okay. Some of the universities, I think as well, I feel like I heard today that mom had maybe canceled their stuff, but don't quote me, look it up yourself. So <laughs> in case mom didn't cancel, I apologize <laughs> to the people's mom. 
No, I just, that, that is what I heard today. I just want to commend everybody too for working really hard and putting this all together because I mean this isn't an easy task. So you know I do appreciate all the hard work that's you know being done. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Schoenberg. Appreciate your comments and questions. Is there anybody else, uh, either online or in-house? Uh, Mr. Sharp. Hi, good evening. Chris Sharp, 30 Mutineer Avenue in Barnegat. I have two little girls in the, uh, in the district. So this question, it might be best for you, uh, Mr. Bambieri, and it's gonna piggyback a little bit off of what you said, ma'am. Um, there are other schools in New Jersey, even surrounding school districts that are offering the option of either full-time or virtual attendance with no hybrid model. I, I highly doubt that any one of them are sacrificing student, sa whoops, sorry, student safety. Um, I'm sure they've all taken every precaution possible to assume that they're only taking prudent risk in doing this. So I guess my question for us is probably the one, the one issue we don't have, or we have maybe that they don't have is 700 some odd students that are fit into a school the size of Collins. So when we say that this was a choice and you know, it, it's there, and I get there is no right answer for all of this. Every school district is going to be do it different ways. I'm curious if this was an actual choice where we could have offered those options, or if it was a choice where that was the only option available to us. Um, so my question, is, and I don't know who would be best suited to answer it. Sure. If we decided as a district, every parent, every teacher, the administration, the superintendent, the staff, the board that we absolutely were adamant. We wanted an option of sending students full-time or doing the completely virtual. Could we honestly have done it with the number of anticipated students that were gonna be in Collins next year, that's 740, and still abide by the governor's uh, directives? Uh, to be quite honest with you, all the buildings, it, does, it wouldn't make a difference as far as, as the Collins specifically or the high school that has a thousand kids in it or um, you know, any of these other schools that, that have the, the five, around the 500 capacity number, it's, it's more about implementing and how you could socially distance the students in, 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 in accordance with what the governor outlined in his roadback plan. So when you look at some of the neighboring districts and somehow some of their, how they're doing it, um, my understanding is one of the neighboring districts is setting up outside areas and telling, encouraging the students to eat their lunch outside, encouraging the students to take classrooms outside and things like that. Um, which might, again, might work very well for another, another district. Um, my understanding is from some of the other district plans, they wanna put, they're gonna put 50 students in a, in a room, um, but they're gonna distance them out, but they're gonna have 50 students in a room where maybe they do related arts or do something like that. When we were looking at what could maximize the instruction of our students here, but also prioritize the safety of not only the students, but the staff, that's where that mindset came up of, you know, and, and in line with the governor's guidance to, reduce the capacity and try to do that alternating. The reason why we did the Friday is fully virtual is because we wanted to give the opportunity to have a set schedule for parents so they knew that their child was gonna go on Monday and Wednesday or Tuesday and Thursday. So you had the ability to try to set up childcare. Um, so to answer your question, to be honest, I, I don't know, I'm not in a room in some of the other districts. And again, I totally agree with you. I don't think that any district would open their doors if they didn't feel like they were safely being able to do so. Um, but as far as us trying to balance in Barnegat, which is what I'm concerned about, Barnegat, when we look at the students here and what we could try to do to safely, to put our, our staff in a position to be safe um, and put our students in a position to be safe, this was the plan that we felt kind of did that balancing of getting the students in the building. Um, like I said to, you know, like I mentioned when uh, Mr. Fjordzik had his question, trying to do that spaced out a little bit so you have that direct instruction, then you kind of take some work on your own, then you do direct instruction, you have some work on your own, then you come in virtually where you get that direct instruction again through a virtual platform. Um, we felt that really balanced, maximized the instruction of the students um, versus also trying to put our best foot forward with safety. And, and you know, listen, I, I guess, you know, time will tell with all this stuff, you know, the districts that open up full time and have every student back, you know, listen, I wish them the best. And I, and my, my child's going to one of those districts. So I, I hope very, you know, I hope that that's a situation where, you know, the students are safe and, and the staff are safe. I would also like to jump in here. There's two things I would like you to consider also. So in one of our neighboring districts in the county, and I just know this one plan particularly is, you would have to ask yourself, is it an effective use of the time for the student to go back to school virtually? Because what's happening is, is the students are still only going 11 or 12 kids in the classroom or whatever half their average classroom size is. But then they're taking a large chunk of those students and placing them in places like the gym 
multi-purpose rooms, auditoriums. And so while the kids are still sitting there having a half a day of school, they're not really getting taught. They're not really getting instruction. So a lot of schools may be also forced into a scenario where they aren't as good at virtual instruction as our district or other districts like us. They might not be at a point where they can put one-on-one -on -one devices out there for students also. So um, when faced with that, like you said, every, every district has a different scenario. And in our, in our scenario, it's good for us because we're, we're getting good at virtual instruction and only getting better with the lessons learned we've gathered from last year too. So um, when I look at it as a parent, not, not just as a board member, I prefer to have my kid home that half a day where I might be able to do other enrichment type of activities with them versus sitting maybe in some holding area waiting for the next activity for 20, 30, 40, 50 minutes, something like that, um, where there's not productive study or activities happening. All right, so, so just to, so we do, we have, if we wanted to choose that as an option, we do have the capability, the space, the available, the, some of the things other schools have done. We would have the ability to offer full-time instruction if we wanted to, but we've chosen to go with the hybrid option as an actual choice? If we feel like we could have done it safely, then yeah, that would be an option. Okay. I don't think that, I feel like that was the overwhelming, you know, message from the task force and, and you know, feedback that we're getting is that that's not, nobody here feels like that we, going in that direction would be in our best interest. Again, I'm not speaking to any other district because like I said, I don't think anybody else would open their doors if they didn't feel the same, but. I, no, thank you, I appreciate it. And like I said, I, I recognize there's no right answer. Um, I was just curious the process we used to come up with this while other districts went, went totally different direction. Yeah, yeah, well, I, I totally agree with you. I, I think honestly, even if you look back at the beginning of it, I think, you know, I, I think this is one of those things that has been very also divisive amongst people thinking that some people feel like this is very serious and they should be taking it very seriously. And they look at the numbers of people that get infected and how quickly it, it, can, it can take off. And they look at the death toll that was associated with this. and, and and some people look at this and feel like, you know, I hear the statistics where they want to compare it to the swine flu or they want to compare it to the regular flu every year. And they want to. So I, I think ultimately, I think that this goes beyond any of the stuff in the reopening plan or any of the stuff. I think that just as, as, as a society, it seems like this is a very divisive issue that some people take it very seriously and some people um, don't think it's that serious. And I think if you, you know, you see that mirrored when you, when you go out and you see some people that have the masks and you see some people that freely just walk around without it and don't think it's that big of a deal. So. <clears throat> All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Lockwood. Good thanks. Thank you, Mr. Carter. Mr. Deemer. Justin Deemer, 31 Benjamin Court. I have two children currently in the school district and one to soon uh, be in the school district. Uh, I was privileged enough to attend the reopening task force uh, meeting. And uh, as a parent, you know, I thrive on information. So for all the parents that are here, you know, and even the board members, I just want you to know that it was the most impressive thing or meeting that I've ever been in. There was 40 to 50 people approximately in that room. And we were there for about an hour and a half. And there was not one single argument. There was not one single, uh, uh, just anybody, you know, having some sort of attitude or whatever. Everybody was in there for one purpose and one purpose only to come up with the absolute best plan that they possibly could and what they felt was best for our students, uh, the staff, uh, for our school district. So I just wanted to say, uh, uh, or give applause to the teachers, right? The administration, uh, the, the board members, uh, uh, I think there was a board member there, there were student nurses, there was uh, uh, principals. Uh, everybody there was great. I mean, they, they just, they had a mission. And when they entered that room, uh, you know, Dr. Atwas got up to the front and said, hey, all right, these are the things we need to iron out. We need to iron these out today. And somebody would say, okay, well, what if we do this? Somebody said, well, you know what, this, this might not work because of this. Okay, all right, let's look at this this way. And they went back and in about 10 minutes, they, they narrowed down one item, right? They went, then they moved on to the next and in about another 10 minutes, they, they uh, narrowed down the next. So I just wanna say, you know, it was fantastic the way that the meeting was run. And I really do feel that, that, that the, the idea and the beliefs that you guys have for the, for the best plan for us and that's great. But with that being said, it is a living document. So with the suggestion of maybe masks being full-time, hey, that's something that maybe we have to look at. But at the end of the day, I'm confident as a parent that, that, that this reopening plan uh, was developed uh, with the best uh, ideas in mind. So I just want to say thank you. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Deemer.
Uh, is there anybody else online who would like to participate? Um, all right, we just got one from uh, Mrs. Rhonda Albano uh, from 2 Avast Avenue. Um, she put her question in the window, um, but if you want to unmute and ask the question directly, you can. Hi, how are you? Hello. Hi. Um, yes, Is I don't know if you may have the answer to this or somebody can make a recommendation, but what are working parents in doing for the for when their kids have to be home? Is there any guidance as to what we could do? Um, do you mean like as far as like childcare for the days that the children are not in school? Yes, correct. So uh, quite honestly, I don't believe that there was any guidance uh, provided in, in that regard back in spring or, or kind of going forward. Um, you know, I think that's something that we all appreciate is a challenge uh, for families that, that, that do work. Um, okay. So I think that is, you know, I think your, your comment is absolutely 100% valid and your concern is 100% valid. Um, okay. As far as from the school district's perspective for providing that, um, that child care, um, that wasn't something that, you know, unfortunately from the school district's perspective, that wasn't something we were able to provide for the parents. Right. And do you know if right at school would be able to provide that during the off days or is that something I would need to ask them? Uh, that would be something that uh, we would have to discuss with them, but that also comes down to then the spacing issue and, and where gotcha. the students are and, and how we're able to house them here. So we are going to be running the before care. We are going to run the after care um, to help, uh, to obviously help the parents uh, with working parents. As far as okay. the, during the day, I don't, I don't believe that we would even have the ability to then space those students out. And if we felt comfortable then bringing in all of those students on those days, then I think it goes back to the argument then. Why not just bring the kids back and have them? In the right. Bed? Okay. Understand. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, up next would be, is anybody in house want to go? Okay. Um, we had um, one question from a person named Gosha or Gosha on the uh, Zoom chat. It said, what is the best email to contact the board? And also, what is the email for Juan Barnegat? Um, the Juan Barnegat email is Juan Barnegat, spelled out, O-N-E-B-A-R-N-E-G-A-T at barnegatschools.com. Um, and then all of the uh, board members' email addresses, I believe, are on Online. the uh, district website. Uh, tab on the top that says board, and you can hit the drop down there to get those um, email addresses. Um, and we also have one other comment about um, from from the public saying uh, from Mrs. Fay, she didn't provide an address. She said to encourage board members to bring their own reusable water bottles. Uh, the one use plastic water bottles are uh, a bad example for our students and that she had no other comments. So, all right. Um, if there are no other uh, people who would like to participate in public public session, uh, I will look for a motion to adjourn or uh, close public session at this point. So moved. Second. Yes. 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 Okay, thank you. Up next is item number seven. We have finance committee motions numbers one through seven. Looking for a motion for those motions. So moved. Second. Is there any board member discussion or questions on this item? Roll call vote, please. Yes. Yes. Mr. O'Brien. Yes. Yes, Steve, I could just about hear you. Then. Because I don't have the mic in front of me. Is that better? <laughs> um, Mr. Zawicki? Yes. Mr. Sherman? Yes. Mr. Hickey? Yes. All right, motions carry. Item number eight, buildings and grounds motions. We only have item number one. Can I have a motion for that? So moved. Oh, uh, there's a number two as well. Oh, yeah, numbers one and two. Thank you. I'm sorry. I, my apologies. I missed Mr. Quelch on that last roll call vote. 
Um, yes, yes. Okay. I, I, I read your mind. So I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. So I have a motion for the buildings and grounds. Uh, I just need a second. second. Is there any questions or discussion on either item on the uh, buildings and grounds? I, I did have a question on the ESIP program. Yep. Mr. O'Brien, go ahead. <clears throat> um, I, I noticed on the presentation for the ESIP, there's a return on investment calculation. Some of them are really, really long term. I was wondering if the selection process, so, so it, it looks like it aggregates them all. Uh, I, I want to give an example here. Um, we have, find it, sorry. Um, an item like uh, high school replacement boilers optimized controls, the payback years is 77.8 years. That's well beyond the useful life of the boiler. Are those going to be selected based on the return at the individual level? Or are you only using the school rate of return at 20 years, which would be significantly shorter without that investment? All right, uh, it might be easier to answer that question of the main objective of that ESIP. Um, that firm identified a bunch of energy conservation measures. Uh, you'll notice there's a number of things like solar, for example, has a very quick payback. Um, and the objective of the ESIP is to have a budget neutral uh, approach to fixing some of our older equipment. So we may have a boiler with a larger payback because that's what it's defined as. Um, the boiler in question, and I'm not sure which one it is, but if that boiler in question was failing us now, we would use that to replace it because we're aggregating that with the solar savings that we have. So the energy savings program won't be approved by the BPU, which then again, that's what the approval is. So this would go to the BPU. It wouldn't be approved by the BPU um, if it didn't net at least zero positive in most cases. Um, and then we wouldn't be able to finance those energy conservation measures, mostly infrastructure equipment. The priority of our projects are gonna be based upon the severity of the need. Um, so if the boiler is breaking, replace the boiler, but if the boiler is working, that would be lower on the priority level. Exactly, and, and it it's kind of becomes a, more of a puzzle than it does uh, just rattling off a, a roster of things. Uh, for example, the Brackman one that we had to figure out different funding for that we're undergoing right now, that was priority number one. It's just time ran out. So we that one slipped to kind of funding it ourselves. But yeah, most of the um, the objectives and the areas of focus were control issues and our HVAC system. And we're basically using the lighting and solar to get those equipment because the low, the low payback, like you mentioned. Right. Okay. But the bottom line is there, there's a zero impact to the budget. That's at the, hopefully more of a positive impact on the budget, but it's not going to be a negative, that's for sure. So, I mean, just to kind of reiterate, that's just to send it to the BPU. When that comes back approved, hopefully by next meeting and in the finance, which um, you'll see, we'll have uh, the finance side of it, which that'll approve the mechanism to go now get the funding to support these projects. And I'm, I'm trying to arrange a little bit more of a comprehensive, detailed presentation to the full board and the public with our architect and our financial people. So you, okay. you can see exactly what's going on. So, hey, we're going to go out and get this money. What are we spending it on? And that's what our architect's going to tell us. Okay. Gotcha. Thank you. Do you have any further questions, Mr. O'Brien? No, that was it. Okay, thank you. Any other board members? Okay, proceed with the roll call vote. Ms. Continanza? Yes. Mr. Geddes? Yes. Mr. O'Brien? Yes. Mrs. Pereira? Now I can't hear. Right. Now I can't hear. Right. Yes. Mr. Sure. Mr. Quelch? Yes. Uh, Mr. Zawicki? Yes. Mr. Sherman? Yes. And Mr. Hickey? Yes. Okay, motion's carried. All right, we are on item number 14, education committee motions. Uh, looking for a motion for items numbers one through five. So moved. Second. Okay. Is there any uh, board member discussion or questions on any of these items? All right, let's proceed with the roll call vote. Ms. Continanza? Yes. Mr. Geddes? Yes. Mr. O'Brien? Yes. Mrs. Pereira? Yes. Mr. Quelch? Yes. 
Mr. Zawicki? Yes. Mr. Sherman? Yes. And Mr. Hickey? Yes. All right, motions carry. We are to number 15, Governance Committee motions. I'm looking for a motion for items number one through seven. So moved. Second. Okay, do we have any discussion here or questions? Just a question, since this is a living document, um, would you be communicating to the board and the public if the document changes significantly? Yeah, the 100%. Similar to the way where you see on uh, motion six, which was our school health related, that was for spring. That's on here because there was a uh, there was a change just to update how we were doing uh, testing for um, special education children. So yes, uh, that would be something that if we made any significant changes, we were looking for approval. That would be something that would go through you know the normal channels of, of discussing it, vetting it, and then it would go on there for a recommendation, uh, a vote for a change. Do you have any other questions, Mr. Geddes? Any other board members? I have a question along those lines. So how, how are you going to consider substantive changes that would require uh, escalation? I guess, I mean, how, how do you decide what what will require a revote? So I, I think it would be like uh, if the governor came out and changed the guidance to the schools or if there was something, you know, internally that we decided as a, as a group that we wanted to go back and revisit. Um, so, you know, let's say... Uh, for sake of argument, let's say half of our population came out and said, you know what, a second thought, we want to go virtual. And that left that we were already at 50% capacity of people that wanted to come back. Then I would approach the board and say, why don't we alter the group one, group two, and have the students come back full time because only half the kids want to come back anyway. Mm -hmm. That would be something that internally we might make a decision to make that adjustment. Um, that would be something that would be recommended to the board um, to change and then, and then alter it. Uh, I think the most obvious thing would be if the governor came out with updated guidance saying, you know, at this point, the curve is flattened and we feel that it's safe for students to return to school, you know, then we would, we would come back and I would make that recommendation to the board then. Okay, thank you. Yeah, additionally, um, Brian and I speak quite a bit, um, you know, usually, if not once, probably two or three times a day. And so when we, he comes up with different issues to see if it meets that threshold and basically um, he'll, he'll ask me, and, um, you know, I'll either kick it to a committee chair or, um, but basically if it changes funding, budget, policy, or education, but if it fits into one of those buckets where it's, it's a board level decision that I would ask him, okay, then how do we want to go about this? Do we want to wait to a regular meeting? Do we want to hit a special meeting, emergency meeting, like we did with the, um, you know, when we did the COVID response like that. Um, and then there's been certain issues where it comes up where I've sent you guys each text individually or I've made phone calls to kind of get a feel for what we're willing to support um, so that we can kind of shape that a little bit before we get together as an entire board. So um, do you have any further questions? No, I'm good. Anyone else? I have no questions, but I do have something to say. All right, go ahead, Mr. When, I, when you do research, like I do a lot of research on this, these children are not the drivers of this pandemic at all, like zero. Like there's not one case in the in children like pre-K through 12th grade that are giving this to their teachers, like none. There's there's not a case in the whole world. But um, the devastation it's doing not having these kids here is terrible. And that's why I just don't go along with this personally because the damage it's doing, the damage that I see these kids not coming here is, it's, it's, it's just terrible. It's terrible, and I feel bad for the kids. I feel bad for the parents. The kids need to be here. I, I, I don't think anybody's arguing I know that. You know that. We, we want the students back. We, I think that where we might differ or disagree would be that yeah. that there is you know research that shows that students can carry it. Yeah. They don't. They're asymptomatic most of the time. That students don't Underline have this condition, but, but they can. Where we live, it. there's zero cases. I, our schools will be safe. Southern will show it. Well, they are gonna. But we need to have these kids in the school. Like we have, it's gonna do a lot of harm. To a lot of people. I feel bad. The good news is they're working on a vaccine right now, which might be out by October, November, which is a good thing for sure. everybody. Excellent. Are you, do you have yeah, any more no, comments? I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Awesome. Yeah, nope. I have a question, Dr. Latwis. Mm -hmm. um, if we, I, I feel like we're doing this to um, caution on safety first. 
So if we do decide, say in a month or two, that you know everybody's like, okay, we're doing really good. Can we go full? I mean, we have um, preparation so that we can just to pull the trigger and just go full full time. Yeah. If, if we if the decision was that, let's say the curve flattened to the point or there was not enough cases or whatever, we wanted to pivot and, and increase the amount of students that come in person. We could do that. Yeah. Right. Um, but I think, again, we have to go back to the safety aspect of feeling comfortable with increasing the amount of students in the classroom. Right. And is it, aren't we always getting changes from the DOE? Isn't this constantly, every day, something different? Correct. Yeah. Two weeks ago, we were told that there wasn't going to be a virtual option. A week ago, we were told there was. So, okay. yeah. So the guidance, the guidance has been very similar to if anybody has a child that's an eighth grader or a senior, where it was a lot of, you know, the guidance was changing all the time as far as what was going to be allowed or not allowed. Um, you know, that's that's where that stems from. Uh, you know, there, there is that that constant um, fluctuation as far as what, you know, people are comfortable with or not comfortable with or, or allowed to do or not allowed to do. I think a big part of the nature um, of, you know, the idea behind socially distancing students in the classroom was the idea that they didn't have to wear the mask the whole time because there's also, you know, research out there that shows that, you know, the the level of oxygen that your body takes in can have a negative impact on your health if you have a mask on for that extended period of time. So I think that was one of the bigger driving forces behind having the less kids in the class and being able to space them out is the idea that you were able to then not require that mask full time, um, you know, of the students. So. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, at this time we'll proceed with the roll call vote. Ms. Contenanza? Yes. Mr. Geddes? Yes. Mr. O'Brien? Yes. Mrs. Pereira? Yes. Mr. Quelch? I'm a yes to one, two, three, four, and six, and then no to five and seven. Mr. Zawicki? Yes. Mr. Sherman? Yes. Mr. Hickey? Yes. Okay, motions carry. Item number 16, personnel committee motions, numbers one through 28. Can I get a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion on personnel motions? Let's proceed with the roll call vote. Okay, Ms. Contenanza. Yes. Mr. Geddes? Uh, I'll abstain on number six. Yes to all. Mrs. Pereira? Yes. Mr. Quelch? Yes. Mr. Zawicki? Yes. Mr. Sherman? Yes. Mr. Hickey? Yes. Okay, motion's carried. Uh, forgot me this time, let me yes. Did I miss you? Yeah. I knew it, it my <laughs> computer winked out, I'm sorry about that. Sean. Mr. O'Brien. Yeah. Motion carries. Oh, I'm sorry, yes. <laughs> my apologies. <laughs> Item number 17, personnel committee, information only. Uh, it's just covering insight staff that will be doing a uh, long-term covering. Okay, we are now at item number 18, executive session resolution, uh, where we'll be discussing uh, legal matters. Um, this time I would like to get a motion for executive session. So moved. So moved. Uh, Ms. Steve, you gonna be, be yeah. sending a link, Steve? Will do, yep. Mr. Geddes. Yes. Mr. Sorry. He said yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. I'm all paranoid that I missed somebody. Uh, <laughs> Mr. O'Brien. Yes. Mrs. Pereira? Yes. Mr. Quelch? Yes. Mr. Zawicki? Yes. Mr. Sherman? Yes. Mr. Hickey? Yes. All right. We're an executive at 841. Here. And Mr. Hickey? Here. We are back in session at 1005. All right, there are no items for new business on the agenda. Moving right along to adjournment. Second. 
All right. Uh, Ms. Contenanza? Yes. Mr. O'Brien? Yes, please. This is prayer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no. Mr. Zawicki? Yes. Mr. Sherman? Yes. Mr. Hickey? Abstain. Yes. Yes. We are adjourned at 10.06.